once again, let me just welcome all of you. And uh, as we celebrate the International Coaching Week as well and celebrate this profession of coaching, uh, we welcome all of you this evening. And just to give you a little bit of um, uh, the whole preparation that we went through to bring this for you today. So me, Azade, and Cecilia. So uh, the three of us really got together to offer this um, as our journey in coaching uh, to really see how is it that we can share that with you today. And um, Cecilia is not with us here today for this session, so we're going to miss her presence. Uh, but we want to honor her presence as well because we really had a good time just preparing what we are going to offer to you today. So um, the session today is uh, an artful journey. Uh, artful coaching is an inner journey. So what we would like to share with you is this whole uh, part of art uh, and artfulness that we have created along our journey in our coaching and how that has also shaped us internally. So we're going to take it inside out to share with you our journey as we also share the journey we've had with our clients. So um, just to give you a little bit of an introduction about me before I hand it over to Azade, um, I'm Andrea Jayatilaka, uh, signing in from Sri Lanka. Uh, I'm the program director for Coach Masters Academy for Sri Lanka and Maldives. Um, I embarked on my journey of uh, coaching with CMA four and a half years ago. And uh, it has been an amazing journey for me um, with, like as they said, with this amazing family of um, students, mentors who have helped us to shape our lives as well. So uh, it's really an honor and a privilege to be able to share a little bit of that journey with you today. So, um, and we invite all of you to come in and share whatever the knowledge and your journey as well as we move along the session today. So Azadeh, can I hand it over to yes. you from here? Thank you so much, Andrea. So yes, actually, Cecilia is very much missed. We had such a great time preparing. She's our program director of the Philippines. And as it's already past 1, PM, 1 a.m. for her, she unfortunately cannot be here with us tonight. But um, for me as well, this uh, has been an amazing journey into the coaching, which I started at CMA. I am now the program director for Iran. We are just launching Iran, so it's, it's, it's in its very beginnings, and I would be so blessed and honored to one day be able to see Iranian students as part of the CMA family. And um, so I am originally Iranian, I'm raised in Germany, and I've been living in Dubai for the past um, nine years. And I have to say that this um, journey into the coaching has been a journey of growth for me. Not only growth in skills, but growth in my development and my self-development. And where I've made huge uh, leaps to find myself and um, who I want to be. So this is partly the reason why Andrea and I are bringing this topic to the table today. So when we get started, we're gonna actually today get started with a short video. So please um, make yourselves comfortable for a very short clip. And I will be sharing that with you just now. Oh, just have to make sure to share the sound. Please let me know if you cannot hear. I, I, I pick up little tricks along the way and uh, I'm far from being an expert. So hopefully this is never used as how to. Um, how to paint, that is. I learned that one doesn't uh, hold a brush like a pencil. You hold it like you're, you're uh, an orchestra leader and you conduct. 
And so having been a, a teacher that had to teach printing and, and writing, I find it quite hilarious that I'm having to learn how to undo some of my habits. I was told multiple times by colleagues that, oh, Karen, you're so creative. But when I did art with little kids, they would always protest, can't do it, can't do it. And I said, neither can I, so we'll do it together. So, well, I am Karen Johansson Musson, and I um, am a retired um, elementary French immersion teacher and decided that I needed to have a different career than what I did while I was working. So then I ended up becoming, I guess, an artist, not knowing that I had that at all in me. So there you go. <laughs> Art to me is just exploring different ways of doing things. I don't know, I've just paint, 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 paint. I can give an example of a painting that I did. When it was done, just looking at it gave me joy. I had to really get outside my comfort zone to even start to paint. So when we moved to a new location, meaning we moved from Moen Sound to Stratford, I knew that I needed to, quote, join the community. Well, that, what does that mean? So you get to know people. You know, you go out for coffee and they talk about their interests and then they say, oh, I need to get a studio and get back painting. And then you say, well, that sounds like a good idea. And then they say, I need somebody to share the costs. And you say, I don't know anyone who could share the costs. And then you think, oh, well, maybe I'll try. When you move to a new community, you have the chance to reinvent yourself. There's a lot of creative energy, not just in this building per se, but in the town. It's, it's sort of, um, you know, oh, someone's doing that. And you see things and you say, okay, you can do that, can you? Oh, you're allowed to do that, are you? Oh, and it just was a whole a revelation to me, whereas I thought it all had to be, you, are, you had to have a skill and it had to be there. But I've learned that you have to develop it. So I had to say, am I gonna regret not having tried it? have to view life as you're always learning something. And so I'm enjoying the fact that I am always trying to push my boundaries a little bit more and more. And I just go through little learning curves. You know, I, I can't do it, I can't do it. And then you go, oh, oh I can't. And I can't do it, I can't do it, I can't. And, then, oh, and, and so it, it taught me or is teaching me that the messages that we give to ourselves are often not accurate. And so we tell ourselves we can't do it, so we don't try. So I had to kind of put that down and say, okay, so what if it doesn't work out? And I finally got it in my head that all I'm doing is practicing. And when you practice, you make mistakes. So then I could accept when things didn't turn out all right. And I realized that among many people, we all can paint. We all can do something creative. It's just allowing yourself to do it. So, as we share this video, I'm wondering if uh, you're all thinking, so why are we um, bringing in something about artists and painting? into coaching. So what are your thoughts? What are some connections that you're making between coaching and art? Feel free to write it in the chat box. Um, what are some things that come, come to mind for you? So I'm unable to read the chat box because I'm sharing the screen. Um, Andrea, I can is, help you with a few. Thank yeah. you. Thank so you. So it says, beautiful. So it says uh, both are 
a journey of exploration. Um, always practice, learn and develop. Allow yourself to make mistakes. Beautiful. And um, it was about unlearning something and allowing herself to try others. Accepting yeah. there is a learning curve and stretching beyond the unknown. Beautiful. I, I really like what you're sharing. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah. so I guess for us as well, right, Andrea? It's um, So I am quite the art lover. I have always been since my childhood. And um, I draw parallels to art a lot when I look at coaching because um, coaching itself requires a lot of skills or these competencies. And what is art is actually taking on a skill, right? A craft. And as you take on an art form, you are spending time learning this craft. At the beginning, it's a mechanical way. So if you start with painting, it's just the strokes. When you start with music, you start with the basics, learning the notes. And um, then you start expanding. You go from learning just a small measure of notes into learning a whole small uh, little song into at some point in time, a real piece. So what happens as you take on this skill is that it's not that you're taking on a skill itself, but that skill is integrated and absorbed into your being. And that skill is as if you are taking it in with all pores and you're breathing it, you're feeling it, you're sensing it, and it becomes a whole part of your being. So with that, it's not that art is something that we form, but art actually ends up transforming us. And this whole journey into um, artfulness requires for us to let ourselves explore new ways, go through learning curves, go through phases of not knowing and unlearning and learning, which can be a struggle. It can be painful. But what happens is that at some point in time, when this art form has, has, has uh, expresses itself, that is then our true authentic um, expression that is showing itself through the art form. So with this, we want to actually today with you appreciate coaching as an art and how these core competencies, how we integrate them, in, not in, as, a, as a thing we do as in how to, but we integrate them into our being that we're eventually, when we proceed with, on our journey towards artfulness, that they shape our being. Andrea, I pass to you. Yeah. yeah. Oh. As a day? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh, you're going um, Okay, I'm, I'm really sorry. Give me one second. Oh, I think, so I will continue from there um, until Andrea comes back. So what we'd like to share with you today is that in CMA, we believe in the evocative inside out approach. So we, we believe that in order to create a sustainable change, we have to um, go inwards into the client. So we have to gain an awareness we have to go through the phase of raising the awareness and deepening the understanding in order to find out where is it that the change, the sustainable change can happen for the client. And today, what we're, what we're actually trying to explore with you is that everything that we actually try to do in the coaching is something that actually reflects back and um, comes back to what we end up having to take on as a journey um, for ourselves as well. So this is where we say that we have to um, turn to ourselves for we can only take our clients as far as we have gone. And in our depth of our exploration, in the space that we're holding and creating for our clients, it can only be as open and as um, the space that we are able to um, open our, ourselves up for. So therefore, join us today as we go into this exploration of um, 
the core competencies of cultivating trust and presence, um, listening actively, and evoking awareness, which are these newly defined um, core, uh, core competencies of ICF, where we want to go through um, the main principles of these um, core competencies and how we actually relate these core competencies to ourselves. I just want to check if um, Andrea is back here with us. Yeah. Are you here? Oh, great. Yes, so I'm going to pass am. on to you. All right, dear. Okay. Yes. Thank you. And I'm really sorry about my connection. So like, um, as it is said, we're just going to touch on a few um, competencies. And uh, I'd like to just open up to you. So when we say cultivating trust, what comes to your mind? Maybe you can just type into the chat box. Um, in terms of trust, what is it that comes into your mind? Authenticity, warmth, lovely, a safe space, transparency, being truthful. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that and being real and respecting. So just uh, touching on the um, new ICF core competency, uh, there is a small extract which is on the slide. And as I'm sharing it with you, um, there are three things I would like to just uh, share. Uh, one, our trust and the trust that we have in our clients. So I feel the more we become artful uh, and the more we experience the resourcefulness of uh, the human being who is in front of us, um, to hold the belief that they have within them all the resources they need, uh, is I feel... Uh, one of the most important things for me that I have uh, learned and nurtured in my coaching journey. Similarly, um, to trust ourselves in the whole coaching process. Uh, when I say trust ourselves, to really be authentically who we are. Um, and I remember like when I started my coaching journey, how you start watching master coaches coach and you, you try to learn what they do. But to uniquely bring your full self into that whole space of coaching and to trust that your self-expression is something that uh, you can give your clients. And the third thing that like, I would like to share is about the trust in the process. Um, I feel having been in this journey of coaching, um, and experience that sacredness of the coaching process of how much it can go inside out to really bring uh, that alignment of us into uh, our whole being and to re really allow us to make sovereign choices in our life. So trust I'm sorry, just to check, is it me cannot hear? We can hear you anymore, Andrea. It seems her picture is frozen now. Oh, yeah. okay. So sorry right. for the internet connection. <laughs> I think the connection is not so good today, so... Uh, Everyone is working from home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So... We'll just give it one moment if she's not there. I think she will. I'm, back I, am back. Uh, I am okay, back. I am back. I'm really Can sorry you... about the connection today. <laughs> it's all right. Yeah. So um, we are really talking about vulnerability. And um, we would like to ask you the question, what does being vulnerable mean to you? And uh, as they will share uh, the link to Menti, and um, we would like you to just pick up that link and uh, paste it on your browser and answer the 
question for us? Just one moment, please. No problem. So, um, thinking of vulnerability, I think uh, we all hold many beliefs around how we bring ourselves into the coaching process. So, um, in my journey, I feel I have really um, challenged some of those beliefs, uh, some of which are like, uh, okay, so initially uh, when I got into coaching, I thought it's important to be completely prepared and, you know, get all my, uh, you know, questions ready and all of that. But as you journey into this whole artfulness of coaching to trust yourself and to be vulnerable around that. So to let go of some of those things and, and just be present was something that I started to believe in. Uh, and I think we have Menti uh, link on the chat box now. It's Lovely. coming now. Yeah. Thank you. So, so what does being vulnerable mean to me? And that is to be gullible, to have courage to show your true self, disclosing weaknesses. Lovely. And I think courage oh. keeps coming up. Sorry. Oops. That's okay. Yes. Being kind to yourself, be truthful and be open to yourself, being ready to reveal your deepest fears and secrets without being hurt. Beautiful. Okay, so, so when it comes to um, vulnerability and uh, really linking it into art, um, Maybe if we can go on to that slide as well, which has the quote, uh, I'd like to just put that forward. Um, so vulnerability is the birthplace for innovation and creativity um, and change. So the more we become vulnerable as a coach, uh, the more we are able to really allow that creativity and change to take place. Uh, and similarly, um, since we are really linking this whole uh, space of coaching into an art, um, for any art, if we embrace vulnerability, that is where the real creativity comes in. So um, how is it that we bring our full self into this space of coaching? Um, just touching on uh, Brené Brown's work on vulnerability, um, she says vulnerability is uncertainty, risk, and emotional exposure. So, like I said before, um, when we are really in front of the client, when our client is vulnerable, it takes a lot of courage for them to be vulnerable. And for us as a coach, um, also it takes a lot of courage to bring ourselves into that space of being vulnerable, to our emotions as well. So, however, in our own journeys, we have experienced how weak you can feel in this whole space of vulnerability. And with that weakness comes a huge courage. And with that courage comes a lot of trust. So I think there is a lot of vulnerability that comes into place in terms of building trust. So there are some myths that come about to say that vulnerability is weakness. And um, I think this whole journey in coaching um, makes sure that it is a myth only. And yes, it takes a lot of courage to bring vulnerability and that really builds on trust. So um, like we spoke about, so trust and um, presence are like married together. So there are two competencies that go hand in hand in the whole coaching process. And when I speak about presence, a quote that comes to my, my mind is, um, great artists are people who find a way to be uh, themselves in their art. And I feel um, coaching is like a dance, just like an art. So initially when we start, like if I take myself back to like 18 years when I first joined my dancing class, I remember, um, I thought I was quite good at it. 
and uh, the first class was more about you know getting the steps right and then you're stepping on the toes of the other person <laughs> half the time but when you start really getting into the flow of that dance um and you really embody that into yourself it becomes a completely different rhythm the more we embody it it's really about how am i being in that space how am i enjoying that whole space with my client and it really doesn't matter who the client is thereafter because you are who you are and you have already created that whole flow in the dance um so talking about presence um and also looking at the little extract of the uh, core competency of icf icf uh, talks about um that's okay icf talks about uh, being fully conscious and uh, listening to the whole person of the client and in terms of presence i feel what is that full partnership we create in that core space is about how we listen to our client and the whole person how is it that we tune into their beliefs we tune in to listen to their values uh, and we tune in to listen to what is that real alignment for themselves and something that comes to my mind when i talk about presence is uh, my learning about empathy um so over the years i thought i knew what empathy was and as i started getting into coaching i really started to experience the meaning of the word empathy initially i remember when clients would share something really emotional my first instinct would be okay how do i rescue this client and move the client forward and as time went by i understood that these were some of my inherent habits how i wanted to help people and i had to make some changes into that to really understand that empathy is about acknowledging my client's emotions uh, to be respectful uh, to really be able to see what is positive in what the client is bringing in rather than trying to rescue or look at the silver lining or just trying to you know make things look good so to really acknowledge the client's emotions is something i learned in that whole space of um i think i shared it quite a bit in terms of learning empathy there so um so that's a little bit on the empathy part and the competency and um i'd like to talk a little bit about stillness and when i think about this stillness um i feel presence has helped me to become a person who is more still um i remember about 2 years ago um i used to have quite a hectic life and i used to juggle two or three jobs and as i learned to let go of some things i started to experience stillness in my life and i feel that same stillness is what i am able to offer to my clients in the process of coaching and when i say stillness there it's about the quieter i get as a coach the more i pause the more i'm allowing my client to share and the more i reflect the more i'm allowing my client to create meaning for themselves and the more i hold space for my client the more they are able to create new possibilities for them so i feel this stillness has really um helped me to become low in energy and trust that my client has the greatness that they want to create in that space um while i'm really taking this whole presence inside out i'll just share one recent example a, a recent experience i've had in my life so um on the 28th of april uh, my mom fell ill and my mom stays with me and my family my two daughters and my husband and um so my mom is like a power woman she loves to you know help around and do stuff so it has helped me to uh, do a full time job because of 
the energy she gives me. So on the 28th of April, when she fell ill, um, it really shifted a lot of things for me. And for a minute, I had to like take a pause to think about it. And as I was thinking about it, it was a new identity for me as a daughter. My mom who took care of me uh, now needed to be taken care of. And I thought about it and asked myself, how am I going to honor this new identity of being a daughter who is going to take care of my mom? And the more I did that, I started to really appreciate the change that was happening around me. And since the 28th of April until today, it has been like a magical experience for me to uh, enjoy the new things I'm doing and also to share that with my mom in a very different way. So I feel presence has brought in uh, that part of it into my life as well. Um, so a question we would like to ask you here is, I think we all go on our journey when it comes to bringing our whole self into the space of coaching. So the question is, what holds me back from being present or from being fully present in a coaching conversation? It may be an assumption, it may be a belief. Um, so we will again um, post the link for Menti and uh, you can go up there and share your thoughts. So uh, while we get that up as well, I'm just going to um, probably share with you two tips that I have incorporated into my life to inculcate presence. And one of it is whenever I feel that there is incongruence, some kind of misalignment that I'm having, and the more we tune into ourselves, we start to uh, feel it really fast. And what I, what I really do is I sit down and write everything that goes in my thought process. And that has helped me to understand some of my habits. It has helped me to challenge some of my beliefs by really understanding what's going on in my mind. So that's one tip. And um, the second tip that I would like to share with you is um, a mindful practice that, that I do. Uh, which is exercise. And this is also something that came about as a result of me acknowledging one of my vulnerabilities. So um, a year ago, I had gained quite a bit of weight. And um, I used to avoid this conversation about weight. Whenever people spoke about it, I would try to avoid the conversation. And one day, as I started to accept this more, I realized that um, I needed to change some of my beliefs there. And one of the beliefs that I needed to change was, um, I thought to myself, I coach people and I'm inspiring people to make changes. And I need to make that change for myself first. So I held the belief that uh, I need to lead by example. And I started exercising and uh, I lost almost 14 kilos. And with that, um, one day when I was on the treadmill, this whole belief lead by example just didn't seem to resonate anymore because it felt like I had just passed that. And I think this is exactly what our clients experience as well in terms of stretching perspectives. So when I was on the treadmill, the belief that came to my mind is mind, body and soul are part of one system. And I think just listening to that and becoming mindful around that has really helped me to understand what is my thought pattern and what kind of attention do I have there. So um, I see that uh, there were some thoughts that were shared uh, on Menti. Uh, that's okay, Azade. We'll just let that go. So I think we gave an opportunity to just share some thoughts. So as I share around mind, body, and soul, um, I feel it's how we tune in to listen to this whole integration. 
sometimes our mind says we are not ready and our body is ready sometimes our body says i'm not ready but the mind is ready and how do we nurture all of this and align ourselves to really tune in and listen so i feel this is where uh, deep active listening comes into play as well and as the day is going to take us through that part of it um shall we just go through some yeah. of the things that everyone has shared concerning what holds us back from being present because I guess yes. being aware is the first step on when we're speaking about what what holds us back you know how can we improve our presence I guess the first step for all of us is to become aware and to gain awareness about what's happening so here it's really nice to see you wrote your thoughts around judgment, um, distractions, busy agenda, performance, um, inner monkey mind, self-talk, emotions, negative self-talk, the mind wandering off, um, the perception to know the answers. So I guess one of the things that um, kind of shines through um, with presence is that the mind is quite... Um, busy and also sometimes in the coaching conversations we find that our mind is going through process what should i be doing what should i be asking what am i supposed to be listening our mind is going between so many places and um this is where we're trying to stretch that muscle into how can we be fully present in the moment and just be there for our client how can we just hold this space and park all of this that's happening and all the questions aside and just focus on being there for the client. One thing that has been really useful for me was um, I, I uh, play the piano. So uh, when I play the piano, um, that is a moment where I experience where my mind is fully still, where I don't hear anything, I don't see anything. And in times when I'm also stressed or even stretched, I, the first thing I do is I go to the piano. And that is where I can just release everything from my mind. And I just find myself in this space of pure stillness. And interestingly, I have to say that it's been for me such a, um, I've benefited so much from this experience, as Andrea just mentioned, her um, treadmill experience, for me, bring, linking my experience with playing the piano to coaching. So that was, I was able to experience that moment of stillness there. And that is what I reminded myself of in the coaching that I thought, okay, how can I bring that here? How can I try to bring that same sense of presence here? So for me, I think one thing in um, practicing presence I know that one of the things that everyone says is um, practicing mindfulness exercises, which I actually personally do find very useful. But I guess it's something that depends on the person. But I guess we can practice presence with anything that we do. So we could practice presence um, washing dishes, being there washing dishes. We can practice presence um, being with our kids because we're just saying I'm just focusing on being with my kids. So I guess that is something, a muscle that we can train all the time with everything that we do. And moving on from there, we go to the next competency. And that is where I'm curious to know, when you think about listening actively, what comes to mind for you? Write it for us in the chat box, or maybe if you wanna just come in and share, what are some things that come to mind for you with listening actively? Can I share? Sure. Anastasia. Um, thank you. For me, this is um, to hold a space for the other person when we're having conversation. And by holding space, I mean um, being present, as you said, um, keeping the eye contact if it's possible when when we the camera alive it is um, um, creating a psychological safety so the person know that this is a trustful environment 
Um, so I think it's, it's also an energy level. So it's not only like, it's not about saying like, now I'm actively listening, right? It's, it's do what you do now. It's a smiling, it's a kind of being engaged in conversation, not to think what you're going to say next when the person finished saying. So this, this kind of thing. Love Thank that. You. So being there in the moment, listening with all senses, um, listening and responding to that moment and um you mentioned um yeah beyond beyond the senses in a way beyond just that listening and i see a few people are writing as well so being attentive in the moment letting the other person know that he's being heard not listening with just your mind but also with your heart i love that being engaged um, listening for what's said and unsaid, being attentive and showing interest in what is being said by the client. Beautiful. So yeah, I, I, I guess um, for me, I remember when I first started the coaching, um, when I signed up for the ACC course, I thought I was a good listener. Um, that was what I thought about myself. And then I registered for the course and we have at CMA this part where we dive into the practice, the practical part. And when I had my first practical practice, I realized that maybe I am not quite listening <laughs> to everything. Where listening actually took on a new meaning for me. And since then, I, I've, I have to say that the coaching journey opened up a new definition of listening and a new way of appreciation. For me, this sense I oftentimes, when we're training, I bring the metaphor of big elephant ears, because for me, that's what it is. It seems like we as coaches develop these big elephant ears, and or it becomes like a super sense, the listening. It's not just like a normal sense, but it's a sense that goes beyond hearing. And in the artfulness, um, we're able to see that it's not only what is being said, but it's as if you not only hear, but you see, and you're able to feel, and you're able to sense. So it becomes a super, super sense in a way. And one thing with artful, um, artful um, way of listening is that you actually listen with a sense of curiosity, a blank page, no judgments, without assumption, and a listening that is not to respond or listening that for coaches, sometimes we're thinking, well, what am I going to answer now? What is my question going to be? What am I going to have to ask next? Or uh, what am I supposed to be? What is she meaning? And making sense of what the client is saying while the client is talking. But am I actually just listening or am I listening to assess and make meaning? So I guess um, at this point, it's, it's kind of um, a sense of curiosity to learn uh, from the client and about the client. A sense of curiosity to be open, to not hold any judgment, but to just see the person and how that person is seeing and perceiving their world. Is there anything, Andrea, that you would like to um, add to that, to the part of listening? Thanks, Azade. So I think uh, for me um, also to, in the curiosity part that you touched on, to really listen to, um, to learn about the client. Uh, there's so much about the client, what are their strengths, what are their values, so to really be curious, to learn that in the whole process. And when I say be curious, to be curious like a little kid who is um, really, um, really looking out for what is really coming up, not just in the words that the client is saying, but also um, what is behind the words in terms of how the client is being. So are we listening to just the words and beyond the words? So that's something I would like to add there. Thanks, Thank Azadeh. you. And the second part of this listening part is um, how do we listen to ourselves? 
the part of the inner journey part is also becoming aware of what are we listening for and listening in, in ourselves. And this is the part where we see that the quieter we become, the more we can hear, as in what are the talks that are taking place within us or what are some um, self-talks that are happening? What are those values that we're listening and able to hear in ourselves? What is that purpose or sense of purpose that we're able to hear? Those are all being whispered inside. So making space and taking that silent time in order to be able to also listen to ourselves so that we can hear um, our clients. So um, a few tips from our side um, on practicing listening. Again, like presence, I guess this is a muscle to be trained at, trained at all times. And um, so Andrea, would you like to share? something um, so I think like for me to be curious to listen to um, the inner inner thoughts like what are those beliefs what are those values um, in my life it has been quite significant for places where I have listened to my values and nurtured those values and lived by it so I think the more we listen and attune ourselves to listen to those deeper parts of our lives. So as a practice, maybe to have, um, so what I do is I have like a day that I spend on myself to really understand what I need to nurture. So that's one thing. Beautiful. And for me, I guess it's taking moments of silence. Um, taking a meditation practice and also just engaging in any kind of conversation with anyone, not only with our clients, but really becoming the observer and curious, you know, observer to see, wow, I mean, people are so fascinating to watch and to listen to. And sometimes I guess one way that I try to train myself the most is when I I'm most tempted to react when I am actually listening to, let's say, my, my, my partner say something that I don't agree with or I'm not really able to understand. But am I in that moment able to hold a space where I'm not going to respond or react to what I'm listening to, but am I able to just listen to understand? I guess this is one thing where I am still learning and trying to practice. Um, moving on to the next core competency is evoking awareness. And I really have to say, well, there are no core competencies that go above the other, one above the other. But I do have to be honest to say that this is one of my favorite ones. Um, if, because, well, not favorite because they all go together. We can't perform one without the other. We can't evoke awareness if we're not listening because what we listen to is what we're gonna use to ask and inquire powerful questions, direct communication in order to draw out, to evoke from the client. So they all go together, but there's something special about evoking awareness that happens here that I am personally so touched by. And this has been something that has been a part of my journey that stood out. This is the part, I guess, this exploration where we go into those spaces of unknown. The spaces where we're sometimes not so comfortable to go to. Those spaces that we, uh, that are out of our comfort zone where we are maybe also a little bit resistant or we just don't have the clarity or we don't know, don't see. So in CMA, we believe in um, this, we, we follow this iceberg theory where there is a level that is of knowledge that is known to us in our conscious level. And there's a whole iceberg part underneath that is beyond the surface that is not conscious to us. And I guess, and what we um, say at, uh, or what we believe in CMA is that in this stage of evoking awareness, we try to lift this iceberg, bring it up to the surface so that the client can see what it is that they were not able to see before. 
So this is the moments where we're able to ex expand on or be able to evoke what is actually holding back, holding us back. What are those limiting beliefs or limited perceptions that are not allowing us to see beyond? And what is the depth of wisdom and resourcefulness that we actually hold from within that is available to us from which we can draw from? So I guess here um, I would have to share for me um, the exploration that really stood out for me is from a client's perspective in CMA, um, we have the possibility to be coached by so many peers. And I've had a few um, coaching conversations where they have been pivotal in my um, self-development. And one of them was a coaching conversation that I had with um, Dr. Ben Koch in my mentoring. And it was when actually for this mastery level, I thought I'm quite, you know, I just gained my PCC. So I thought I had quite a level of awareness of what's going on. I actually picked my own metaphor going into the conversation, um, saying that I think I have the sorted. I just need to figure out what is that last piece here that I'm not getting. So my metaphor that I took into the conversation was, um, well, I'm seeing myself as this little kitten but I wanna be this tiger. And the image that I took into the conversation was a, a kitten looking into the water and seeing a tiger. So I thought I was quite clear about what I wanna have and how I'm seeing it. Until Dr. Ben Ko asked me, well, what if, what, what if I were to say to you that you are the tiger and not the kitten? And it took me a moment to be able to process that question where I couldn't answer. I said, well, no, in my perspective, I am the kitten and I want to be the tiger. And he said, well, well, what if it were the reverse? What would you be seeing in the kitten? What would the tiger be seeing in the kitten that the tiger would want to be having? And that is where I felt my mind stretch into ways that I never thought before and come up with answers that I never, never thought of. And then it went a step further where he asked me, so it seems that you're going between these two of the tiger and the kitten, and it seems that this metaphor is not really serving you. So what other metaphor could come to mind? And then the conversation brought about this metaphor of a flower unfolding itself. That was completely not what I had in mind, but what it actually meant for me was that what I was seeking was within me, that I was seeking from the outside. And what happened there for me is that a completely new way of perceiving unfolded itself and a completely new truth that, and possibility from which I no longer could see things the way I saw them before. And, from, and this is the moment, this is exactly the moment where a change can actually happen. And a change happened for me. I left this conversation with a metaphor and with three words that have become my mantra. And I have to say that this conversation and these pillars that I see for myself have become a pillar for me to draw from my inner strength and to see myself and my resourcefulness. And so exactly this moment is what I wanna cherish because I've been blessed as a coach to be able to witness um, coaching clients and seeing how in this stage of evoking awareness, suddenly the client shifts their voice changes. They have this certain certainty about them. And it seems like they're all of a sudden accessing an inner wisdom within them and gaining answers from themselves. And this is exactly the moment that's not to be missed. And this is the moment that I would like to really honor as a coach and as a, you know, artful coach. Andrea, is there something here you'd like to share about this? Yes, yeah, I think, um... You said it beautifully <laughs> and if I were to add on it, it would be about 
um, how this whole evoking awareness part becomes a part of your life journey. And for me, it's a process that never ends. And um, I think that's what makes it more beautiful. It takes you into a place where you start seeing those resources within yourself and it's just continuous. It just continues to show you more. The more you start um, um, reaping on those, I think the more you start seeing those resources and that's probably what um, helps us to hear that whisper uh, and what we uh, really have as a calling. So yeah, so for me, it's more like a journey and a process which is continuous. So yeah, I guess this, thank you. So this part is really about exploring the unknown and going into those territories to find out what it is that we really honor, what it is that our values. And um, so basically in this part, was we, what we have as a tip is to commit to being the observer, uh, com commit to being the observer of ourselves, learning from um, our clients, so within the conversation, it's not that we hold the answers, but really holding that space to learn about and from the client. And one more thing here, it's about asking, using what we learn and in order to draw out and evoke. And what we can actually evoke with is practicing to be succinct and concise in what we're act actually saying. So, um, I guess with this, we've touched on some of the main um, competencies that um, we see as muscles. We don't just see them as skills of how to do or something that we have to do, but they're muscles that become a part of our being that we actually in incorporate throughout the whole day in the way that we are. Um, yet yeah, we have to know that we have, to, as, an, as an artist, we have to, um, actually nourish ourselves. So Andrea, I think you wanted to touch on this quote that you really liked. Yeah, so uh, I think as we integrate our thoughts here, um, for me, as I read this quote, it really connects to a place where um, as coaches, how do we really take care of ourselves as well in this whole journey of taking care of our clients? And um, as I say that, um, something that comes to my mind is in my first um, few experiences in coaching, after a coaching conversation, when you come out, there is this feeling uh, like I could have done that, you know, this whole inner critic kind of thing that starts to work with you. And as I have been, um, I think, as I journeyed in the coaching um, and where am I now, I feel like I'm in a place where I now wonder about that experience more than being a critic. Um, to wonder in a way, uh, to look at that whole conversation and to appreciate what really worked there and to also look at what is it that I have a choice to change for my next conversation. And I think that whole um, way of looking at it changing and creating that whole approach of self-care and bringing in wonder into the practice of coaching has been something that has been a big shift for me, uh, I would think, in the last few months. So I thought I'll just share that here. Yeah, I think I, for me too, I think there's this one part about practice, practicing to be kind to ourselves and also practicing to nourish ourselves. So... With that, I think we just move on to the next slide, which is um, as we're looking at the journey of um, artful co coaching towards artfulness or artful coaching, um, there are different stages and, you know, even moving from the different levels of coaching from ACC to PCC, we compare this to the life cycle of the butterfly. And um, we we're able to see that there's four stages that happen in the life cycle of a butterfly. In the first stage, it's the nourishment stage, which is the foundation for our new formation where the caterpillar just feeds. 
So basically, this is the stage where we take on a skill and we try to practice, practice, practice putting it into place. The second stage is the shedding of old patterns, where the caterpillar sheds um, his skin about four to five times. So this is where we recognize what serves us and what doesn't serve us in our development. What are some things that are holding us back that we can let go of, such as um, limiting beliefs or those talks that the artist was talking about at the beginning that hold us back. The third stage is the stage of internalization and introspection, where we go inwards and try to take the learning inside and see um, and explore um, what are those things holding us back? What is available to us as a resource that we could tap into? And the fourth and final stage, which is the restructuring and breakdown, um, this is where the caterpillar actually takes on a completely new form. It's not that the caterpillar changes into a butterfly. This is the phenomena of nature that actually the caterpillar um, breaks down its parts and takes down a completely new form. And this is where, um, I guess, in this level of transformation at this stage, it's where um, our learning about ourselves is no longer at a horizontal level that we are just acquiring a skill, but it's a vertical level of learning and reflection on ourselves where we gain a new level of understanding and knowing, seeing and knowing things in a different light from how we knew it before, becoming clear about our what we honor, what is our purpose, what is our meaning. And I think I'd like to, at this stage, relate this to um, us finding what it is that brings us to the coaching, what it is that is basically our calling and how we um, are no longer doing what we do just because this is what we do, but we are actually practicing coaching because this is who we are. Andrea? Yeah. Thanks, Azadeh. And I'd, I'd like to just add uh, there. So for me, um, in this whole journey to really listen to what is the essence of my life and something I hold for myself is that um, wisdom tells me I'm nothing. Love tells me that I'm everything. And my life flows between these two. So um, this is what I hold for myself. And I, I um, try, I think I've come to a place where I'm able to live by that. And I feel we all have chosen this uh, journey and we all have some kind of a calling here. And um, the last thought I'd like to leave with you is um, I'm, I'm thinking of this um, greeting namaste, uh, the meaning of it being the divine in me meets the divine in you and you create greatness. And I think this is what we uh, do in the coaching conversation where we together with our client bring that whole uh, space where they are able to create um, greatness and I think uh, one of you shared it's about a whole energy space that we create there and um, today uh, I think the idea of our sharing was also to bring our whole selves to you and I'm sure um, you are also in some way bringing your whole self to share your journey with us. Um, we would like to just play this clip and then probably open up to just listen to how you would like to bring your whole self and share what you're taking away as well. Um, so we have a final clip which will take a few minutes and I know we are a little over time. Um, so maybe you can just sit back and enjoy. Okay. As we um, get the clip on, 
um, maybe just think about what is it that you are taking away from the session and um, maybe at the end we can all share some of our thoughts and if you have any questions you can also ask um, so if there's anyone who likes to share as a day shall we open up to sharing or um, And the reason is, see? Uh, is because it's so hard that yeah, if you don't... You can't see it. Okay, oh, you now we can. See it? Can you see it? Now okay. we can, yes. Any rational person would give up. It's really hard. People say you, you have to have a lot of passion for what you're doing, and it's totally true. And the reason is, uh, is because it's so hard that if you don't, any rational person would give up. It's really hard, and you have to do it over a sustained period of time. So if you don't love it, if you're not having fun doing it, you don't really love it, uh, you're gonna give up. And that's what happens to most people, actually. If you really look at, 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 at the ones that uh, ended up you know, being successful, unquote, in the eyes of society, and the ones that didn't, oftentimes, it, it's the ones that are successful loved what they did so they could persevere when, you know, when it got really tough. And, and the ones that, that didn't love it quit because they're sane, right? Who would want to put up with this stuff if you don't love it? So it's a lot of hard work and, and it's a lot of worrying constantly. And uh, um, if you don't love it, you're going to fail. So you got to love it, you got to have passion. When you start out, you have to deal with the problems of failure. You need to be thick skinned to learn that not every project will survive. A freelance life, a life in the arts, is sometimes like putting messages in bottles on a desert island and hoping that someone will find one of your bottles and open it and read it and put something in a bottle that will wash its way back to you. Appreciation or a commission or money or love. And you have to accept that you may put out hundreds of things for every bottle that winds up coming back. If you have an idea of what you want to make what you were put here to do, then just go and do that. And that's much harder than it sounds, and sometimes in the end so much easier than you might imagine. Because normally there are things you have to do before you can get to the place you want to be. But when you have a dream, it doesn't often come at you screaming in your face, this is who you are, this is what you must be for the rest of your life. Sometimes a dream almost whispers. And I've always said to my kids, the hardest thing to listen to, your instincts, your human personal intuition, always whispers, it never shouts. Very hard to hear. So you have to, every day of your lives, be ready to hear what whispers in your ear. It very rarely shouts. You've got to find what you love. And that is as true for work as it is for your lovers. Your work is going to fill a large part of your life. And the only way to be truly satisfied is to do what you believe is great work. And the only way to do great work is to love what you do. Sometimes life is hard. Things go wrong. In life, and in love, and in business, and in friendship, and in health, and in all the other ways that life can go wrong. And when things get tough, this is what you should do. Make good art.
So thank you. So that is it for our presentation for today. And our message from this to you is basically, we're so, I think what brings us all together here today is our passion, our common passion for what we do. And for wanting to create a positive change through what we do, to wanting to contribute. And, you know, enjoying and loving what we do is supporting us in order to continuously grow and work on ourselves to become or to move towards that path of artfulness. So thank you for being with us today. And please share with us um, what are your thoughts. We, I know we've taken so much of your time, but it would be great to hear a few things from you as to wrap up. What are you taking from this session? Andrea? Yes, Adey, I think it would be nice to listen. Rajesh, would you like to share something? I think you yeah. just came up. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I think, thank you very much. It was a very, very wonderful session. And you sharing your own journey and experiences was really awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I have just one uh, question. Uh, this is a challenge I face when I do the couple of coaching sessions I did in the past. Uh, uh, at the time of awareness uh, session, uh, I don't know whether I've expanded the client's awareness enough or no. And I don't know at what stage I need to get into clarity stage. You know, I get confused. Uh, so how do you handle and how, how you get conviction that yes, the awareness has expanded enough. Now we, it's a good time to go into clarity. W what is that signal, you know? I guess um, it's a little bit difficult for us to answer this question, not knowing, um, you know, what case it is and, you know, to, to just come up with um, a general let's say, of how to, of how to do it, you know? Um, I guess um, that I, I find it really difficult to, to come to that question uh, with you not knowing what the exact example of it is. Yeah, I understand. There's no formula. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a very subjective thing and it would like depend on the style of the client, like how they are sharing to what their learning style is. So um, I guess, it, yeah, so it's a pretty subjective question, but yes, you would need to really look at it case by case because some clients may share with very little words. So how is it that you have expanded the mind? And some clients may share a lot. So what is it in terms of managing content there? So it's a very subjective thing, Rajesh. And yeah. I, I guess um, um, what I can tell you probably with our journey is it is um, the experience that you have with many clients that will give you that uh, sense that, yes, I have now come to that point where I have expanded the mind of the client and there is a story here now. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I hope that helped you. you. Yeah. Yeah. I can go next. Yeah, go, go ahead, Kanti. Oh, lady, this was beautiful. I think um, the journey that you both shared, it's been very confusing from the time I've signed up for this program. Am I like capable, not capable? A lot of noises, right? Um, but the way you guys articulated your stories, it seems like I think we are in okay space. Um, we're okay. It's not as bad as I was thinking. And um, your... Um, conversation on having the ears uh, leave the human ear and grow the muscle so much that it becomes the elephant ear i think that's the journey we need to take on because that's really looks looking like that's really the first step to the coaching journey and then comes evoking so the first step itself has to be really really mastered well so yeah going back to rajesh's question also maybe that's where the answer is if you're able to hear listen Exactly. Without judging, maybe we'll get somewhere. Maybe. And I think one thing to really appreciate about what I really appreciate about having seen this um, analogy to the life cycle is that these four stages are all essential and dependent on one another. You can't have the full completion without having four stages. 
And we may be sometimes frustrated thinking, why am I in this stage? But I need to be in that stage in order to move to the next stage. And there's not one that is more important or above the other. They all belong to part of the process. Thank you so much. Yeah. Anything else that you, you would like to share? I know it's so late for most of you. It's so late for Andrea as well. <laughs> so um, it's been such a pleasure having you here. I hope that um, you know, we're wishing you a great journey. And I think the most essential part is to enjoy and find joy in it, right? And to really appreciate and savor the moment, every step that we are, and to also be okay be okay with wherever we are and to consistently work on ourselves. So I guess one thing that I appreciate art for so much is that an artist is never finished. An artist is never done. An artist is always a work in progress, continuously working on themselves and their craft, never becoming complacent. So I guess this is our all path, right? Um, trying to continuously grow, grow while being kind to ourselves. Yes, Yang? Yeah, my, my, yeah, may I say my um, takeaway? Uh, actually, it's very nice of both of you to, to share with us your uh, art art journey today. Uh, actually, during the, uh, I'm uh, a student of the cohort uh, 230, 230, and uh, during the online training, um, when I observe the, the, the coaching session, I learned a lot. Uh, from from the the the, the on the live coaching sessions and I see myself there uh, and when I reflect with myself I learn a lot and and I, I must say that I'm a better me after um, that online training <laughs> so yes. may, may I have one question um, so uh, the first part you talk about the trust you in trust with the client uh, so during the training, um, for the beginning of the coaching, we just talk uh, about um, say uh, say time, uh, great form and invite uh, invite people to be uh, self centered and then start the conversation. But uh, in the real life, if we are peer uh, students, then we we understand the um, the, the, the situation that. Uh, so sorry, we not share outside. But um, my question is that if I have a client outside who don't know about coaching, no, have no experience about coaching, and is the first time uh, the client is having a coaching session, shall we tell the client that on the story share in the um, coaching conversation is kept secret so that they, the client can share more more freely? They don't feel vulnerable to share their story. Um, so, um, if shall we? Can can you just please repeat back only the question part? That that um, shall we be open to share our experience? That I understand you correctly, so that the client is willing to share. Yeah. Yes. Um. So I think in part of the um, the um, coaching agreement, we try to establish the relationship, the coaching relationship, and make clear what the coaching relationship is um, between the client and the coach. But in terms of the developing the trust, um, it is, again, how we hold, it's demonstrated through how we hold the space for the client and how we, it's not necessarily um, how we respond with what we know, but how we allow for the client to be in a space where they can share. So for example, I could be demonstrating trust by just saying something like, I'm not sure whether I understood you correctly, Jung, just now. I may have not heard what you said. Would it be okay for you to repeat that back to me? So there, 
demonstrating my own vulnerability that I don't know. And maybe there has been a moment where I didn't know or I didn't catch something. And would it be okay for you to share that? You know, this allows for the client to be able to see that I am not holder of, I am human. I'm not holder of all answers. There's something that I don't know as well. And when I'm able to reflect that and demonstrate that, um, in that moment, or if I'm able to say, may I just have a moment to gather my thoughts um, before I can continue? You know, taking that moment to pause, you know, so that the client is able to see that I'm also processing and I'm not holder of all answers. Does that answer your question? Yeah, actually, I understand what you say, but my question is that. Um, I don't know what the coaching agreement uh, is not introduced very clearly during the training. Oh, I see. Setting the yeah. well, I th I think for the coaching I, agreement, is, mm -hmm. yeah. So my my question is that since I don't know where the coaching agreement and in the during the training we just touch that at the beginning of the coaching conversation we never touch about the coaching agreement so that um, if we are peer on the student we understand but for the a new client the one who doesn't know about coaching shall we give them the that information at the beginning of the coaching conversation so that they are more open when they share the story andrea would you like to also share with that yeah, so uh, I'll just ask one question. I'm, I'm just trying to create a little bit of clarity around this uh, again. So you've just completed the training, is it? Like the online training? Yes. Okay, and you're going to be on uh, supervised practical coaching after that? Yeah. Yes. So um, that's probably one place where you will um, really see the whole uh, coaching process being put into practice. And uh, you will start to see full conversations and how the coaching agreement comes into being. So there are case studies that will be um, unfolded in the whole supervised practical coaching. Mm -hmm. So I feel uh, that might be a place where you will get some clarity around uh, this because that's where you really see the whole conversation. But, um, and I think what you're also referring to is the coaching agreement with the client, the contracting that takes place before the um, setting the terms and the contracting where I think you will also find a lot of extensive information on the ICF web on the ICF page. But um, since this is not really related to this webinar, please feel free. I will put my email address here for you as well so that you can reach out to us and ask the specific question once more that we can address to you if that is of help for you. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. I also sure. will look for the coaching agreement and read more about that because it's yes. didn't say very clearly during the training. Sure. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. So, as a day, if there is any other sharing, shall we just ask yes. for maybe one more and then close the session? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So maybe just one last sharing and then we will close the session. If there's anyone who'd like to say something or share. Yeah, go ahead, Jolene. Hi, everyone. It's Jolene from New Zealand. So it's pretty early for us, 6.30. Oh. Or, yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to take the opportunity because of the beautiful, beautiful knowledge online. Um, and maybe I think Nora, she's online. You know, love and finding the art of what you do and maybe a client finding love in something they don't necessarily enjoy doing. You know, if you're in a career, you don't love it, but practically you need the money. The balance between finding the love in the role or changing completely to find the art. I just wondered if you had some inspiration for me. <laughs> I 
Well, I would uh, go ahead, you first. Andrea. Go ahead, Anthony. I'll let you go. I'll let you go. <laughs> Well, this is where I would say we're coaches and are not going to be able to give you any answers, I'm afraid. <laughs> and I think this is my invitation to you is um, that journey to this exploration, you know, that this is where the journey to the exploration would maybe begin or has already begun, answering these questions, right? I mean, um, in my path, I personally... Um, I come from a completely different background. I, I had a business education and um, I, I was practicing in business, but I was not happy with the job I was doing. And um, that is what these questions are what put me on a path. Answering these questions is what actually brought me to where I am and these explorations. Um, you know, really going in and exploring and finding the answers. That is what is basically brought me to find my own answers. That's why. I